Well, praise God. Brother Jimmy almost encouraged me there. I'm so glad we've got a foundation for encouragement. It isn't just happy talk. God has given us truth, and it's a wonderful thing when we can come together and, and encourage one another and, and get our eyes kind of refocused and, and see how, what God has done for us. Uh, I appreciate it. You know, Don reminded us of that scripture there in 1 Corinthians 8 that tells us, uh, you know, a little bit about the divine order. That's not what I'm mainly focused on, but we know that God, the Father, is the highest authority in the universe. There's a uniqueness about him. There is, uh, when you're talking about the one who was the highest, you're talking about the Father. And way back somewhere, <laughs> if you can even use words like, that have to do with time, uh, he and his son came, you know, came to a plan of creating this universe that we see and bringing forth uh, a race through Adam and Eve that were in originally designed and brought forth to be his sons and daughters. That was his intention. We were made in his image. We were given a dominion. We were given a, a, an honored place in the economy of God. And of course we know what happened that uh, our first parents decided they wanted to go a different direction. And so they rebelled against, the, against God and against his son. And plunge the world into the darkness that we see all around us. And, uh, you know, we see the fruit of it in the very uh, shaking and the very uncertainty. People are running to and fro and worried and, and who knows what's coming. And you have the sense that the other shoe hasn't fallen yet. Well, it probably hasn't. But praise God, we've got something else to live for, something else to hope in. If your hope is in this world, if your hope is in you, if your hope is in your ability to somehow scrabble your way through life, you have got, well, you, you, have, you have a vain hope. Right. It's not going to take you anywhere. Right. But I'll tell you, God has given us a hope. Yes. And instead of destroying the race that had become so corrupted, God, set, God, because he's a God of love, set his heart upon rescuing a people. Right. And you know, when he sent his son into the world, that in itself is an amazing thing. I mean, we know the, the humiliation that that took. He didn't have, I mean, he had everything. Except the Father's plan and, and the love of the Father for us required that he use that love, that he express that love in humbling himself to become a man. He actually came to become a part of the very race that had been corrupted. And it's not that he himself was corrupt or he himself sinned, but yet he identified himself completely with us. He was made just like you and me. And he felt the same things that you and I feel. God sent him with a mission. And that mission was to save his people from their sins. And the way the prophecy was given and the message was given prior to his birth, he will save his people from their sins. That sounds pretty positive to me. Jimmy, you've got a foundation for what you said, brother. He, he will save his people from their sins. It's not a, not a maybe, not a, oh, I hope I can pull it off kind of thing. There is a certainty yeah. to the plan and the purpose of God. Right. And I thank God for that certainty. And the certainty is not there because of anything in me. It's not dependent upon my faithfulness or my ability. It's dependent upon the perfection. The completeness of the Savior who was sent into the world. Yes. Praise God. Praise God for what, he, for what he did. You know, I noticed something, and I'll just trust this kind of fits in at this point, but uh, go back to Matthew chapter 3. You know, we were sp speaking about baptism last week, and brethren, we need to go ahead and set a date here. Uh, think about that. But anyway, that's a side note. But you know, before Jesus came on the scene, the Lord sent John the Baptist, his natural cousin. John was raised up from the time of his birth. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was a chosen vessel sent to absolutely proclaim a message to the people of that day saying, repent of your sins. The kingdom of God is here. Come, I mean, the, the Savior is about to come. You need to get ready. And people by the thousands flocked out to him to hear the message of this crazy man in the wilderness 
who lived out there and, uh, you know, dressed funny and ate funny and, and you know, didn't, didn't do things the way other people did. But he had, a, he had a convincing message. The Spirit of God was on him. Amen. That makes all the difference. Amen. You know, if it's just a man expounding his ideas, that's one thing. But if you've got, a, you've got God's Spirit yeah. anointing a man with a message, there's going to be somebody that will be impacted by that. Yeah. It, will have a, it, will have a, it will change someone's heart. Amen. It'll reach beyond just the reasonings of the mind and all of that. There will be something that will go out and just grab people. Amen. And so it did. And people came from everywhere and they were confessing their sins, it says in verse 6. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And that's what the significance of the baptism was. And of course, you had some religious folks. It says, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, these were uh, parties with strong religious traditions. They were opposed to each other, but... You know, in this case, they were really in the same boat. Regardless of the details of their religion, they were religious. They were depending on their religion. They were, they were doers, they were not trusters. Folks, where, where are you this morning? Are you trusting in what God has done, or are you still trying to do something to get God to accept you? Praise God. Well, see, these people were in that place. But they, they, they heard all the commotion. They came out to where he was baptizing and said to them, You brood of vipers. <laughs> you bunch of snakes. He didn't, uh, yeah, he wasn't uh, diplomatic, was he? He pointed to their, their true spiritual condition, the true, the true uh, what, 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 the inspiration is the word I'm looking for. The inspiration behind their religion was the devil. You know, how did the devil come and what guise did he come to Eve in the beginning? Deception. Was it, well, deception, but what guise? It was a serpent. That's right. yeah. It was a snake. And so that becomes a symbol, you see, of satanic power. And that's what was ruling in these people. It says, you're, you, you think you're Abraham's children? Your father's the devil. It seemed like Jesus said that later, didn't he? Yeah. John chapter 8 said, you are of your father the devil. But anyway, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. So there was a real change that, that God was seeking to bring about in people's lives. Turn away from the way you've been going. There's another way coming. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. Praise God. That, there's a lot in that. And I don't want to go off in some of these side side roads there, but I'll tell you, God is raising up a people that has nothing to do with religion, with natural heritage, or with anything else. If you're trusting in the fact that you were raised a Baptist, I'll pick on them, pick on anybody, could be anybody. If you're trusting in the fact that you were raised to be religious and nice and good and moral and all that stuff and, and practice a religion, forget it. Right. You better throw that in the garbage. If it does, if it's not as something that is real, that Jesus Christ has come into your heart and changed your life, you have nothing. That's right. This is a supernatural work. God is calling out a people from a corrupt world yes. to be united with a Savior who is all sufficient. Yes. That's what it comes down to. Praise God. Amen. So anyway, the, the, the axe is already at the root of the trees, and I would say that of this world. That could be said today. The axe is at the root of the trees. A lot of trees. Yeah. But God is going to prove which, one, which trees, spiritually speaking, are, are the ones that he planted. That's right. God is planting a people. Yeah. I believe we've got some, some of his people here today. Yeah. And I praise God. But God wants us to be encouraged and to have a vision of where we're at. So we're not swallowed up by the, the confusion and the, and the darkness that there is in this world. But anyway, every tree that does not produce good fruit will, will be cut down and thrown into the fire. That's right. Well, praise God. Anybody here is capable of producing good fruit? No, I'm not either. But thank God, I got somebody in me. That's all he does produce. Lord, if we lean on him, if we draw, if we draw from him, if we walk in the salvation that he's provided, good fruit happens. Amen. It happens because he is the producer of all life and all goodness and all good fruit. Amen. Praise God. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. 
His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. You want to know where the world's going? Praise God, it does turn out for good for those who align themselves with Jesus Christ. And I say, they surrender to him. It's not just like I align myself. I am surrendering to his call. Amen. I'm identifying himself, myself completely with him and with his people. I'm his for time and eternity. My hope is in him. I'm trusting in him to take care of the reason why everybody else is going to be burned up. Because that's, that's what he says is going to happen here. But here's a thought. You know, was it Ron last week that re read this or referred to it? I think it was. Do you remember Ron? <laughs> Praise God. Anyway, the, uh, the fact that Jesus himself came to be baptized. It, it uh, you know, it, it's caused a lot of people to say, you know, I wonder why in the world would he do that? He didn't have any sins, and this is a baptism of repentance. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John, and jo but John tried to deter him. I mean, John said, wait a minute, whoa, this isn't right. You're coming to me? I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus said, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Now, you know, we used to hear Brother Thomas say, and rightly so, that he was, I mean, John was the anointed servant of God. He was God's voice. He was God, the way, the one through whom God was acting at the time. And in submitting to him, he was submitting to the God who sent him. Well, that's absolutely right. But I see another dimension to this that is, is astonishing. And I, I, I don't know if I can wrap my mind around it. But this was a baptism of repentance. And I'm here to tell you, Jesus was repenting. Now, I figured I'd get silence on that one. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Jesus was identified completely with the people that he came to. To save. Did he not become sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God? That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Jesus became so identified with you and you and you and me that he assumed our guilt and went down into that water and repented. Not just for himself, because he didn't have anything to repent of. He, there was a repentance. There was a renunciation of sin. This was a foreshadowing of his death that was to come, by the way. You know, that's what baptism signifies. It's a dying and a raising to, new, to newness of life. But there was, a, there was a genuine repentance on the part of Jesus, even though he had no personal sin. We were so much a part of him that he repented on our behalf. You think of... Cases in the scriptures where you see this principle. There is a corporateness. There is a oneness. There is a wholeness to the kingdom of God that it so connects us that we have no idea. We are so geared to be just individuals living our lives saying, I'm okay, sorry about you, that we don't get it. We don't understand how much God has made us one with each other. Praise God. You think of Daniel when he prayed and he went to God. He, he read the prophecy of, of Jeremiah that said, I'm, I'm going to send you, I'm going to carry you into captivity and 70 years are going to pass and then you're going to come back. What did Daniel do? He prayed. What did he pray? His prayer was a prayer of repentance. And it wasn't Daniel saying, oh God, I messed up. It was God, Daniel crying out, we have sinned. Daniel completely identified himself with a people who had sinned and been judged. And there was a sense of repentance. Folks, I think a lot of times we need to repent for the condition that we're all in and assume the responsibility. Didn't that, wasn't, didn't that happen in, uh, in the case of Achan? What was God's word to, to, uh, to Joshua, was it? Israel has sinned. My God, how does God see us? He sees us as one. But Jesus completely gave himself for us. And he didn't just start here, he started there. 
My God, the love that he has shown for you this morning and for me is beyond our power to describe. He gave everything that he had. He gave his life. And he took our sins upon, him, upon himself and repented. And God declared him, said, this is my son. I'm well pleased in him. Praise God. Well, as I said, that foreshadowed what he did at the cross. I'll tell you, when he went to the cross, he didn't go alone. Now, I could, I, could, I could take time, and I don't know that I'll, I'll do that this morning, but I could t I'll tell you that when Jesus went to the cross, he went as the representative of all humanity. Every bit of it was gathered into him. He represented the very creation that he had been instrumental in speaking into existence. All of it was gathered to him, and he willingly subjected himself to the punishment you and I deserved. All the wrath of God that you deserved, that I deserved, was poured out upon him Amen. in our place. And he died. As Paul said, yes, I will turn to it. Praise God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I think. Verse 14, for Christ's love compels us. Now, Paul's talking about his ministry here. He's talking about what it was that motivated him, what it was that drove him to do what he did and to proclaim the message that he did. He said, God's love motivates us. It compels us. Why? Because we are convinced that one died for all. Now, doesn't that tell you what I just said? Yes. He died and when he died, everybody died. I mean, in the purpose of the plan of God. I realize there's an outworking because here we still are. But I'll tell you, the, the, the end of this world is as certain as if it has already happened. Because God passed sentence on the world. Jesus said in John chapter 12, now is the judgment of this world. Now the prince of this world is cast out. Folks, the one that, that puffs and huffs so much against you and me has been defeated at the cross. Amen. He was completely defeated. He was cast out. He knows it. The problem is we don't. And we still listen to, the, to that, those dark voices. And I'm just as guilty as you are. We, boy, I tell you, we need to rise up and say, wait a minute. This is, doesn't make a bit of sense. Look what God has done for us. But one died for all. Praise God. It says, and what is the, what is the uh, conclusion of that statement? One died for all. Well, what do you conclude by that? All They're all, all dead. Yeah. If one died as the representative of all, then everybody's dead. They don't know it yet. But I'll tell you, that, there is a certainty to the outcome of this world. But there is a certainty for those that are in Christ that we need to lay hold of. And we need, to, we need to have as an anchor of our soul. Isn't that what the writer of the Hebrews says? This hope we have as an anchor for the soul. Do you have that anchor this morning? Praise God. If you got it, you got, so you got a reason to be shouting and be rejoicing. Amen. And not letting the devil steal your joy. Because we have a, we have a foundation to be, to be rejoicing this morning. Amen. And praising God. Praise the Lord. Paul was convinced that one died for all, therefore all are dead. So he had a message that was going out to dead people. And that message had the power to bring them to life. Well, doesn't that kind of remind you of Ephesians chapter 2? You were dead in your trespasses and sins. But you've been made alive. When were you made alive? You were made alive when Jesus was raised from the dead. God did something miraculous there that absolutely gives us a foundation to stand upon. Because you didn't, if, if you're in Christ today, you didn't just die, you were raised from the dead to the kind of life that can never die. Why do we bellyache and complain so much? We have something in us that is eternal. Amen. God lives in the heart of everyone who's repented of their sins and put their faith in Jesus Christ. Praise God. 
And he died for all. Now there was a reason that he did this. Of course it was judgment for, for, for many. But he says, and he died for all that those who live. Now there are some among those who died who live. There are some who are absolutely brought to life. They're, they came forth from the grave. He took everybody into the grave with him. He brought, he brought many out. That's right. He brought many out in the purpose of God. God said he's going to save his people from their sins. I'll tell you what, there is a life that has come from him. There is a brand new creation. One, when he died, a creation died. When he was raised, a new creation was born. Amen. Just wrap your mind around that. I tell you, we're talking about a new creation to come. It's here. Amen. It's here. You don't see it yet. You don't see it with natural eyes. But the very life of that new creation is in his people. There is a seed that is growing. There is something that is happening. We see, we see the challenges. We see the, the difficulties of the way. And we, we sometimes waver in our, in our minds and our hearts. But God sees the certainty of the outcome of what he has begun because it is founded not upon you, not upon me. It is founded upon Jesus and something that already happened. And the devil cannot undo what happened. Praise God. Praise God. I'm about to encourage myself here. Amen. Bless the Lord. And so here you have, he died for all. Then you have some who live. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Praise God. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Paul had a different perspective on life he saw men through different eyes. He saw God's people. He saw those who were dead, but he also saw among the dead those who, could, who would hear and believe the gospel. Amen. And so he gave out, by the anointing of God's spirit, he gave out a message of hope, trusting that God would take that message, would sow the seed in the hearts of those who could receive it, and they would be brought to life. Amen. Praise God. And so his conclusion there is obvious, therefore... In view of what we have just said about what Jesus has done, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, well, now, where is Christ? Well, I mean, that's a vague question, I realize. I have a way of asking these open-ended, vague questions. But anyway, I just want to make a point. Christ is no longer in that grave, is he? Christ came forth from the grave he didn't just come forth, he ascended on high. Where is he there? If figuratively speaking, he's on the right hand of the majesty on high, the highest authority of the universe, and he has been given all authority in heaven and earth. And he's been and all of that has been done for what? For what purpose? To what end? For us. For you, for me. For everyone who can hear it and believe it, God's message of hope is for everyone who hears his word and believes it from their heart. Amen. Puts their trust in the one who died there. Praise God. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Is, 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 is. You may not look like it, and I certainly don't. But I'll tell you, there is a new creation that is real. And I'll tell you who knows it. The devil knows it. Amen. That's why you and I are our targets. That's why the devil gets after us so much. He sees, he knows. He sees the light of Christ in the heart where Christ resides. Amen. And he is going to do everything in his power to mess it up. Can he succeed? No. He may, may cause some wobbles along the way, but I'll tell you what. God's going to finish what he started. Amen. God is the ultimate authority. He's given that authority to his son. Gather me a people. Do something that doesn't depend on their weakness and their inability. Do something that is sure. Yeah. Cause people to trust in a foundation that will, that will stand no matter what is thrown at it. Praise God. So therefore, if any man, anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation the old has gone, the new has come. But we don't quite live that way, do we? You know what Paul said in Romans chapter 6, that we, we need to do a lot more reckoning than we do. Yeah. 
reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God. If you put money in the bank, you generally reckon on it. When you're writing a check, you reckon on that money being there. And hopefully it is if you've been a good bookkeeper and, and all that sort of thing. But I'll tell you, this bank has got everything needed. And the Lord has laid up riches beyond compare. You're not talking about Cadillacs and whatever, all whatever luxuries people value today. Who knows? I can't keep up with that, but that's all right. But I'll tell you, there's a true riches. And God has filled the bank of heaven with everything that is necessary for you and me. And we need to cash more checks. We need to reckon on the reality of what Jesus did because it will, become, it will come to be real, experientially real, as we lay hold of it by faith. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from your effort, your, wait, wait a minute. All this is from God. Now we're going to go right back to the greatest power in the universe, every bit of this comes from Him. Yeah. Folks, I can put my hope in something like that. Yeah. I've got something solid. I mean, where else are you going to find a source of comfort and hope and strength today if you're find, trying to find it something someone else has done? Right. I was going to start naming names about people to put their trust in, but I, I'll let you imagine them. But I don't care who it is in this world. Republican or Democrat, Democrat, Republican or Democrat. Uh, I tell you what, I'm not going to get into a political speech, but I'll tell you what, it's a it's a mess out there. I'd rather be part of this kingdom because then it doesn't matter. In one sense, we're gonna we may go through some rough spots, but we're going to have somebody that goes with us. But then we see we're not dependent upon this world or what happens here. We've got examples of, of believers that God is with in extraordinary circumstances, extreme circumstances in other parts of the world, suffering persecution and death. Do you think Jesus has abandoned them and favors us? No. no. He's with everyone. Yeah. And I'll tell you, there's going to be some honored people in heaven who stood fast when it cost them their life. Yeah. You know, a young boy who was about to be killed by some religious extremists. And he said, I don't want to die, but I can't deny the Lord. And they cut off his head. Tell you what, that's current stuff. Well, that particular story, I guess, is a little bit old, but that's, that's going on in parts of the world right now. But I tell you, God is calling a people who are so sold out to him, who have seen by revelation, but God's opened your eyes. It's not some eerie thing I'm talking about. God's opened your eyes enables you to see that Jesus Christ is your hope and your only hope. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself. God is the one who removed the barrier. We are the ones who erected a barrier of sin and rebellion against God. God removed it. Amen. God is the one. We had no power to remove that. What can you do about your sins? But Jesus took them upon himself. He even repented for you and for me at the River Jordan. Amen. Why do we allow sin to continue? Why do we run to it? We need to run to Jesus. Yes. Trust in him. All this is from God who reconciled us. He made us, he brought us to where we could be friends again, if you want to put it in a simple way. Reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us, now Paul's talking about him, himself and the other ministers, gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Oh, praise God. Amen. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And I'd repeat that today. If there's somebody here, who you need what we're talking about. There's a sense of fear and uncertainty in your heart. You cry out to Jesus. I'll tell you, God can, God can wipe away your sins as if they'd never happened. Amen. I'll tell you what, what happens when you really connect with God in faith and repentance. That guilt will be gone. You may have done some terrible things, but the guilt of it is gone. Why? Because Jesus took it upon himself. It's already been done. It's already been paid for. 
Praise God. God wants to set us free from these things. We have a foundation for it. This is not just, just happy talk, as I said. This is something where God has absolutely done something that simply needs to be proclaimed. Amen. And we need to trust him to make this real in people's hearts. And I believe he's doing that. Amen. Praise God. But wherever you're at, be reconciled to God. There's a, you can be. Yes. Are you willing to give up your sins? Are you willing to come God's way and, and be the sinner that you are and say, Oh God, I come. My only hope is to repent. Amen. It's to turn my back and turn my back on the world and say, Devil, I'm through with you. I'm through with your kingdom. I'm, I'm casting my lot with Jesus Christ for time and eternity yes. and with his people. Yes. If Jesus is identified with his people, I guess we ought to be. Yes. That's part of the kingdom of God. But that's another message. But God made him Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the key. It's in him. Yes. I'll tell you, the church is the body that, that Christ lives in. Amen. If you're going somewhere, do you leave part of you behind? Do you say, hand, you've been messed, messing up lately. You ain't coming on this trip. No, a hand's part of me, it's coming. I'll tell you what, if you have been joined to Christ, you are part of him. Amen. He sees you differently than, he, than we see ourselves. We see ourselves as screw-ups, mess-ups, all kinds of negative things that the devil will beat us down with. Jesus sees you as part of him. Amen. He will, his work will never be done until all of us are there, Amen. completely redeemed, completely set free from everything that has to do with what was wrong in the, in the beginning. He will save his people from their sins. And I was thinking about the fact that when Jesus was baptized, there was a voice from heaven that said, you are my son. In you I'm well pleased. But look at Romans chapter 1. Just one little verse there, one little thing to point out. Because when Jesus was raised from the dead, witnessed by hundreds of people, actually, who talked to him, touched him, ate with him, over an extended period of time, there was a reality that they could not shake that sent them out to the world to give their lives for the one that they had seen conquer death. It says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, that gospel regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God. How? By his resurrection from the dead. God has made another declaration. God has borne every witness that you and I should ever need that this is my son, this is the one you need to serve, this is the one you need to put your trust in, and, and what, what is proving it is I raised him from the dead. Amen. This is the one who conquered death. This is the one who conquered, conquered the grave. He conquered the devil and all of his kingdom. That's right. None of it could hold him back. I'll tell you, we're, we're, we become one with him. None of that's going to hold us back either. This is not prosperity, earthly stuff. This is, this is a God who is rescuing us from this evil world and is, and is preparing us for another one. And I'll tell you, he's, praise God. Uh, there's so many scriptures that come to mind, and I'm going to get to one that probably everybody's thought about. But go back to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Because Paul is talking here about his hope. And that's the hope that you know, is beyond this life. He talks about how, you know, we, uh, in, at the end of chapter 4, says we don't lose heart. Any of you lose heart here? You know, we all struggle with that, don't we, at times. But Paul says, therefore, we do not lose heart. The bottom line is we don't lose heart. Sometimes we wobble. But therefore, we do not lose heart, though inwardly we are wasting away yet, Outwardly, rather. We are wasting away. Inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. There's, a, there's something going on. There's a process that has an end in view. 
For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Everything you're going through has to do with what's, what will be. It's actually, not only is it not just an, uh, some kind of impediment that shouldn't be there, this is actually a means God is using to get us there. Yes. That's what he said. You look, at, you look at in that passage, you'll find God is, is absolutely putting his finger on things that hold us back. And he's using the circumstances of life to deliver us from self and sin and all these things that have a hold upon us so that Christ is free to be expressed. Amen. Life, death works in me, but life in you, Paul said. Praise God. Praise God. So, of course, in accordance with what Jimmy said, so we fix our eyes. We fix. We, that's a choice we make. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. Then he talks about the hope that we have that when I, when I leave this body, this, this, I, they finally lay this old body in the, in the tomb, I got something better. Amen. I got something that's eternal. This is a tent. That's a house. Amen. I'm going to leave a tent and move into a house one day, and it's going to be forever. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And so more, uh, that which is mortal, at the end of verse 4, may be swallowed up of life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose. You want to understand what your life is about? You want to understand what's going on? God made you to live with him and to know him. He made you for that reason. And if you're one who has been called by the gospel, that's what your life is about. You've got an eternal God with all the authority that there is, who is on your side, who sent his son and gave a complete, made a complete provision for you and for me to have a perfect hope, a settled hope today. Praise God. All right, so what do we got now? Well, that's what Paul's about to say. Glad you asked. Now, it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, a down payment. Okay? Guaranteeing what is to come. Amen. Praise God. So this isn't just pie in the sky. There's something we very real that we can experience right now. Amen. I'll tell you, you can have something that, you can have a changed heart. Only God can give you that kind of a heart transplant. But that's what the gospel brings for those who open their hearts and believe it with all their heart. Praise God. Amen. Now I know somebody by this time has, has thought of Romans chapter 8. It certainly, certainly fits, doesn't it? Praise God. What a hope that we have in the Lord Jesus. Verse 28, and we know that in all things, God, all things? Are you sure about that? I don't know. Paul, did you make a mistake there? I had some bad stuff happen to me lately, and some just I'm in a place of uncertainty. I don't know what's going on, and it looks like the world's going, my world is going to hell in a handbasket. Are you sure, Paul? Are you just, just sort of closing your eyes and saying, all oh, things are good? No. This is somebody with their eyes wide open. But this is somebody seeing life from a different point of view. This is someone seeing life from God's point of view, saying, you, I mean, you, here you are over here. All you see is uncertainty and turmoil and difficulty. And I'm over here and I'm seeing purpose. I'm seeing something that I, that I accomplished at the cross through my son that is in the process of working out in your life. And I want to tell you the outcome is certain. Amen. Praise God. We know. So Paul had a certainty of this. And he didn't, this wasn't just something he learned, you know, in seminary. This was something God taught him. This was a conviction in his heart. I know this. That in all things, God works. God works for the good of those who love him. Who have been called. What? What? According to his purpose. See, there's a sense there of something that is real, that God has a plan. Oh, I know the devil has a plan. Just cause all the, calls all the hell he can, all the damage he can while he can, because he's angry. Doesn't want you and me to enter into something he can't ever have. But I'll tell you what, 
God has a purpose. And I'll tell you, the purpose of God will stand. It will stand. Man, we need to let this, this mentality, this reality, guide our everyday life. This isn't just something to sort of pay mental, give mental assent to on Sunday morning. This is something you and I need to take with us during the week. And lay hold of and realize it's real. Because if we lay hold of it, we will begin to experience more of what he's talking about here. That's the problem. We talk about it like it's out there. It's not for me. I'm, I'm, you know, it's for everybody else, but not me. It's for you. Amen. It's for you. It's for the weakest. The weakest among you. God doesn't base his salvation on your goodness and your strength. I'll tell you, the ones who came to Jesus so often were the sinners. They were the lowest of the low, despised among men. But Jesus, the love of God, reached out to them and rescued them. Amen. The folks he had the problem with were the, were the righteous people. At least they thought they were. I'll tell you, we need, you need, I don't care what your situation is, you need to look to God and realize Amen. he has power. Yes. Above all the power of death and hell put together Amen. to rescue you completely. If you put your hope in him today and trust in him. There's a purpose for those. And what is that purpose? For those God foreknew. He knew about you ahead of time. He made provision for you ahead of time. He also predestined. God's, God knew about you and he made a plan. And what's that plan? To be conformed to the likeness of his son. You know, we have, a, we have a perfect head with a very imperfect body right now. But when God's purpose is through, that body is going to come to the fullness of the measure of the stature of, the stature of Christ. And God's going to have not just his son, but he's going to have a whole kingdom of sons and daughters. One grand new man, if you want to look at it that way, that's one with each other, one with him, filled with his life, changed completely from all that we are in this world. Only God can do that. But that's what this is about, folks. This isn't about coming to church and being religious. This is about giving your heart to somebody who has the power to change you for, not for time and eternity. Yeah. Conform to the likeness of his son. That he, the son, might be the firstborn among many brothers. God wasn't satisfied with just one. He still wanted a family of those who were like him. Those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. How many times has this been pointed out? Amen. Every bit of this is, is written as, as something that has already taken place. When, did, when was that? When was that? When did, when did all this happen? Well, it happened before the foundation of the world. In the mind of God, I'll tell you, it was accomplished when Jesus went to the cross. Yeah. You wonder why Paul gloried in the cross only? He was dealing with religious people who gloried in other kinds of things that men did. Paul said, I'm going to glory in one thing, the cross. Because I was crucified there. All that was wrong with me was dealt with there. God's taking, he's taking care of this stuff that I'm wrestling with. It was done. Yes. It was done in him. But he didn't leave me in that tomb. He brought me forth with his son and gave me a brand new life. Amen. Praise God. He also glorified. So I'll tell you what. The glory that he, that he enjoys now is there for us as well. Amen. We rejoice in hope, Paul said, of the glory of God. Praise the Lord. Well, what about this next passage? Has this ever been an encouragement to you? It ought to be. It's been quoted this morning. What then? In light of what he's been saying, what then shall we say in response to this? What are you going to say? If God is for us, if God is for us, if God is for us, if God is for me, do you know we need to learn to take these things personally? Yes. I don't mean independently, but I mean personally. Yeah, there's a corporateness, but there's something that gets right down to the individual heart. It's sometimes easy to say, yeah, God's for us, but me, 
That's a different story. Oh, no, it's not. You're part of us. God be for us. Who can be against us? You got somebody who's capable of messing this up? I tell you, we've got a God who's already defeated all of that through his son. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? I mean, here's, here's God. He's given us his son, done all this, and he said, oh, I don't know. I don't think I'm going to follow through with this one. I just didn't really reckon on how bad this situation is. I did all that, I know, but just let it go. I'm going to let, let this one go. I don't care about them. God cares. God is able. Wherever you're at, whatever pit you're in this morning, you look up and you cry out to the only one who can bring you out. There is one who can bring you out of the darkest pit you might be in. David said, the Lord brought me up out of a miry pit, miry clay, deep pit, whatever it was. You remember the psalm. Praise God. God is wanting to encourage and lift us up and, and get our eyes, get our mind refocused on, the, on what he's done for us. But how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Now you've got another situation. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? All right, there's the devil going before God. God, did you see what they did? Did you see? Were you watching? You got some bad folks down there. They messed up in all kinds of ways. You think that God's going to listen to that? No. Why? Because he just says, I don't feel like listening. No, because your sin was already repented for, yeah. forgiven, paid in, full. paid in full. That's exactly right. Died for. Every bit of the legal requirement of the penalty for that sin was taken upon him, taken by Jesus. Praise God. I'll tell you, you lay hold of that, your guilt will be gone. Amen. There's no one that has the right to accuse you of anything. Right. That doesn't mean we live as we please. If you get a hold of this, you'll, you'll be wanting to please Him. Amen. But I'll tell you, you're always going to have a source of, of hope and forgiveness when you do mess up. Amen. Because we are in a process that is often messy. But we got a God who's a great cleaner up of, of messes. Yeah. We've got a God who's able to save completely those to come to him. And of course there brings in the point that he's praying. He's praying for you. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad there's times I'm so tired I can't even pray for myself. Anybody get there? Yeah. But Jesus never gets tired. And you're still part of him even when you feel that way. I'll tell you, if you're in him, he hasn't forgotten about you. He may let you get to that place just so you realize you can't trust yourself. You don't have the strength. That's when we say, oh, okay, God, I've, I've tried, I've tried, I've tried, I can't do it. That's what he was waiting for. So much of the time, that's what he was waiting for, is for us to come to that place of just utter weakness and dependence where we just say, Lord, you're going to have to do the saving. I put my hope in you. Praise God. It is God who justifies. If God, the judge of all the universe, has just said, that one is righteous. You think the devil's going to come along and say, oh, no, he's not. God's declared you and me righteous Amen. because we're part of him. And he's righteous. He became sin for you and for me that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. <laughs> Praise God. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God. And here it is again, and is also interceding, praying for us. Is interceding. That's an ongoing thing. He doesn't pray a while and say, oh, I'm tired of this. They're messing up. Forget them. He is ever interceding. In fact, there's a song like that we used to sing. He is interceding. There's a constant present tense, ongoing activity. In other words, where there's a need, he's praying. Right. There's a need in your life, Jesus is praying. Yeah. God wants you to know that. So you don't ever reach that point where you, you may feel the discouragement, but you never feel the despair. You never give up. You're like Paul. You know, we feel, the, we feel all these terrible things, but we're never in despair. We never get to that point where there's no hope. 
Because there's always a hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. So he's raised to life. He's at the right hand of God. He's praying for you. So then in the light of all that, he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Let's get down the list of all the stuff that might do it. What's going to do it? Shall trouble? No. Trouble have the power to do that? No. Hardship? No. no. Persecution? Maybe that'll do it. No? Okay, well, famine? You know, you've got to have stuff to eat. Or nakedness, or danger, or sword. All these things the devil has been allowed to throw at God's people in various times. And you read Job, you know, that doesn't always happen and often doesn't happen because we've done something bad. God was just trying Job and bringing him forth as gold in the end as Job himself expressed the hope. And I'll tell you what, all these things are part of it. It's, but, but he says, it is written, for, for your sake we face death all day long. We are, as, we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now why would, why would he say that? I mean, that's not a very positive message for me to tell you. You're a bunch of sheep to be slaughtered. Doesn't sound it. But the truth is, that's what's wrong. Folks, you and I have something that needs to be killed. There's so many today that are preaching feel-good messages that just make people, build people up in their self-esteem, make them feel good about themselves, and they call that the gospel. That's not the gospel. I feel, I feel joy this morning. I feel thankfulness this morning. I don't feel it because I find something, some reason in here to hope. I find a Savior who has done something about what's in here. Who is capable of putting me to death at the same time giving me life. Praise God. He took me down with him in the grave and I went there. Thank God I, I need to see myself there. But he didn't leave me there. He came out and I came with him. And I have another life. Praise God. So, yeah, there's something about me that needs slaughtering. And it took place in him. And the experiences of life helped to carry out that sentence where it's needed. God knows exactly how to touch the things in you that hold us back and keep us in a bad place. He knows how to do that. But he also knows how to give us the grace and the life to carry us through. And so Paul goes on and says, no. No what? No, these can't stop God. These can't get in the way. In all these things, not in spite of, but in, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. I mean, you know, conquerors would be pretty good. But see, Paul wasn't uh, just content to, well, we're conquerors, you know, okay. We're more than conquerors. There's a, there's a sense that you, there's no way you can put this into words. You can't quantify this. You can't say, well, this is a level nine and maybe, it, you know, this is a hundred on a scale of one to ten. Or a million on a scale of one to ten. There's no way to measure this one. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That's where it all comes from. Every bit of the virtue, every bit of the victory was won for us. We get to believe it, experience it, exercise it, walk in it. That's what God is, that's what the Christian life is about, is experiencing what Jesus did at the cross Amen. and the resurrection. Amen. And doing that in the hope of God finishing what he started. Well, I think he's able to pull it off, don't you? That's what this is about. Paul was convinced, says, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, Neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. I mean, he just kind of runs out of things to enumerate. So he says, well, anything else, whatever else there is, none of this will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'll tell you, when God sets his love upon you, bank on it. Believe it. Accept it. Don't look in the mirror and say, how could he ever love somebody like me? That's what the gospel is about. There's not one of us that could not, based upon what we are naturally, look in the mirror and say the same thing. I don't care who you, you know, how people appear to you. We're all made of exactly the same stuff. We need the same salvation. Amen. Our natural frames are full of the same corruption that you see in this world. We need a redeemer, but there's a God who sets his love on sinners and has power to save them completely, who put their trust in him. 
Praise God. So wherever you're at this morning, you just you rejoice in the Lord and you put your trust in him if you haven't. Let faith get be born in your heart. See him for who he is, the very son of God. The, the God of the universe has a son. He sent him to be our rescuer, to be our redeemer. All that is needed was taken care of in him. He has been lifted up as Lord for now, for time and eternity. Put your hope in him today. He is the only hope that we have. Praise God. Praise God.